ladies and gentlemen good day and welcome to the q2 results investors conference call of dabur india limited as a reminder all participant clients will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes should you need assistance during this conference please signal an operator by pressing star at 0 on your touchstone phone please note that this conference is being recorded i now hand the conference over to ms isha lamba head investor relations and m&d thank you and over to you ms lamba good evening ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the management of dabur india limited i welcome you to the earnings conference call pertaining to the results for q2 fy25 present here with me are mr mohit malhotra chief executive officer mr ankush jain chief financial officer mr rehan hasan head of sales ms gagan aluwalia vp corporate affairs and mr n krishnan gm finance we will start with an overview of the company's performance by mr mohit malhotra and this will be followed by a qna session i'll now hand over to mr mohit thank you thank you isha good evening ladies and gentlemen we welcome you to dabur india limited's conference call pertaining to results for the quarter ended 30th september 2024 this quarter the sector faced challenges from heavy monsoons floods and high food inflation which slowed down urban consumption especially in the beverage category for us however rural continues to be resilient and has outpaced urban growth for last three quarters we believe urban consumption has bottomed out and should see a improvement going forward as new channels have been growing ahead of general trade this has put some pressure on profitability of our gt channel partners we recognize the challenging times faced by our gt channel partners who are integral to dabur and have significantly contributed to building our esteemed business as part of our commitment to good governance and in solidarity with them we have undertaken one time strategic initiative to rationalize inventories and enhance their profitability as a result our consolidated revenue declined by 5.5% with this one off proactive measure resulted in a temporary dip in sales if this was necessary step to enhance the profitability of our gt distributors and ensure long term health and hygiene of our business our business fundamentals remain strong with all underlying key consumer metrics of market share household penetration secondary sales and compounded annual growth on a positive trajectory our secondary sales during the quarter grew by 2.3% year on year with home and personal care growing at 6% health care growing by 4% in addition we gained market share across 95% of our portfolio the international business exhibited resilience and registered a strong growth of 13% in consumer currency terms within the domestic business home and personal care secondary sales grew by around 6% hair oils grew ahead of the category and gained 40 bps market share we are market leaders in hair oils with representation in both coconut and perfumed hair oils a key white space has been premium ayurvedic hair oil segment that we have been calling out for a long time i'm happy to announce that dabur has entered into an agreement to merge sesa care private limited which has a consolidated turnover of inr 133 crores this proposed merger brings to dabur the premium sesa brand with strong credentials around ayurveda that will complement our existing portfolio and strengthen our presence in the INR 14000 crore hair oil category given dabur's extensive distribution network and category leadership this transaction will bring in substantial revenue and cost synergies sesa brand will also enable us to premiumize our hair oil portfolio as it is gross margin equitable international businesses contribute to 19% of our overall sales with sesa being number 1 ayurvedic therapeutic hair oil in bangladesh market home care portfolio continued on a strong growth trajectory with 9% year on year secondary sales growth 
and market share gains of 220 bips in air fresheners and 510 bips in mosquito repellent cream category. We continue to premiumize and expand our product range in Odonil with gel pockets, diffusers, and premium air fresheners. We have extended Odomos brand into liquid vaporizer format, which is seeing an encouraging response from the market. We intend to scale up this during upcoming months. This initiative will enable the home care portfolio to grow in double digits going forward in the future, taking up the portfolio from 700 crores to around 1000 crores in two to three years time frame. In oral care category, our flagship brand Dabar Red recorded secondary sales of around 5%. We have strong number two position in the category with one out of every two households using Dabar oral care products. Dabar Red toothpaste has a number one position in states like Orissa, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. I am happy to inform you that Dabar Red has become India's first Ayurvedic toothpaste to get accreditation and recognition from Indian Dental Association, a consortium of allopathic dental practitioners. Going forward, we will ramp up our engagement with dentist community to cover around 1 lakh dentists. Our healthcare segment posted a secondary sales growth of 4% to promote all weather consumption of Chavan Prash. We rolled out a special monsoon campaign during the quarter, which has resulted in secondary growth of 12.6% in Chavan Prash. The brand gained 20 BIPs market share to reach 61%. The Chavan Prash category penetration has improved by 10 lakh households from pre-COVID levels. To drive premiumization, we recently launched the Khajur Prash variant, which was very well received by the consumers. Digestive's portfolio recorded a secondary growth of 6% year-on-year, led by good growth in Hajmula and market share gains of 160 bips. Dabar Honey also grew ahead of the category and gained market share of 60 bips. Health Juices and Shilajit recorded a year-on-year -year growth of 20% each, and baby care portfolio grew by 30%. In foods category, the business performed well with 20.6% growth in secondary sales. Barcha continued on a strong footing and grew by 15% both primary and secondary terms, driven by 15% volume growth. Food business, including Barcha, will cross 500 crores this year, as alluded earlier. We intend to continue to grow foods vertical aggressively going forward as well. <coughs> Due to aggressive monsoons leading to floods and landslides in some parts of the country, the juices and nectar category declined in high single digits. Despite the slowdown, we grew ahead of the category and gained volume market shares of 240 bips. We have put in place a multi-pronged strategy of ramping up our drinks portfolio improving affordability through pack price architecture, revenue growth management, and drive premiumization in emerging channels and expanding the distribution footprint to put juices and nectars back on the growth trajectory. Coming to profitability, the consolidated gross margins expanded by 102 basis points. The company increased its investment in advertising and promotion and went up from 6.8% of net sales in quarter two to 7.4%. However, deleverage on account of decline in revenue impacted the operating profit, which was reduced by 16.4%. I am pleased to announce that our company's Dow Jones Sustainability Index score has reported a 170% improvement from 30 to 81 in last two years, reflecting our unwavering commitment to sustainability and responsible governance. I would like to once again reassure you that the underlying business fundamentals remain strong and overall health of the business continues to be robust. With rural growth continuing to be resilient, urban slowdown expected to have bottomed out and riding on the strategic initiatives, we are confident of our performance in the upcoming quarters to be back on track. We remain dedicated to investing behind our brands, expanding our distribution reach and building our back-end capabilities to continue to deliver superior value creation. With this, I conclude my address and open the floor to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. 
Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchtone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to please use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have the first question from the line of Avnish Roy from Nuvama. Please go ahead. Sure, thanks. Uh, my first question is on uh, toothpaste. Uh, so we have seen uh, three results till now in that uh, space. Uh, so you have also grown 5% and uh, the market leader has grown uh, double digit and uh, around 8% uh, volume growth. And the number three player has also seen high single date growth. Uh, so one, uh, how do you see your growth versus uh, the other two players? Second, uh, have you seen a sharp ramp up in the competitive intensity in Q2? And uh, do you see that as a structural uh, development or uh, that was a one-off uh, given uh, the margin pressure which uh, market leader saw? Right. So, Abhinish, overall, Oral-K category is uh, growing quite well. We have grown ahead of the category at around 5% uh, value, and we've gained market shares also in Dabur Red. Besides Dabur Red, even Miswak has performed very well in the quarter, and also Dabur Herbal Toothpaste for us has been doing very well. Even Lal Dant Manjan, which is our uh, tooth powder brand, has also grown by 7% in terms of secondary. So all the vectors of oral care for us have done well in the market and market shares have gone well. I can't comment so much on the competitor. Yeah, I think on back of price increases, uh, but volume growth you're saying is around 8%. So I really can't comment on the market leader as far as this is concerned. But as far as we are there, I think oral care is one of the very aggressive vectors uh, which we will keep pushing to drive our growth. On oral care, I would want to mention one thing that we are really seeing huge tailwinds on uh, our product portfolio in international business. Oral care uh, will be one of the second vectors of our growth besides hair care in the international business. By the way, we have uh, completely saturated our installed capacity in markets like Egypt, MENA, etc. on oral care and we are augmenting capacity there. So there is a real heavy tailwind towards herbal, natural and Ayurvedic products in oral care. In many countries, in uh, MENA and in Egypt, we have already become number two and number three brands placating large global competitors that we have there. As a matter of fact, in Egypt, we've become the number two brand in oral care and we are putting up special install capacities and the business is surging at the rate of around 70 to 80 percent on volume terms. Even in Meena, we are seeing a huge growth happening in oral care. As far as competitive intensity in India is concerned, yes, from the competitor and the market leader, we've seen competitive intensity gone up, but uh, we are matching up uh, their uh, prowess in uh, trade uh, and in visibility in the marketplace. Understood. Uh, my second question is on uh, the fruit juice and uh, Campacola impact. Uh, you were the first uh, company to really highlight the risk uh, well before other companies. Uh, you uh, said uh, on the impact of Campacola in Q1. So I wanted to understand now uh, uh, Coca-Cola is also looking to cut prices from 25 rupee to 20 rupee in the 400 ml. Uh, so if you could talk about that, uh, how does that impact your price architecture? Second is uh, if you could discuss Campacola in your market, uh, how much is now the presence? Because what we understand is still uh, it is in few markets. So if it is in few markets, how come uh, the impact is there on pan-India business for you? Yeah, so as far as beverage is concerned, A, the season did not favor us. I think besides the season, which is more monsoon and flood lets, I think second was competitive intensity being high. What has happened, it doesn't really directly impact our business, but the pack price architecture and the pricing index has actually become worse. So for us, the one liter pack happens to be 130 rupees and for colas, the one liter pack happens to be around 50 rupees. So the price index RPI has gone worse, uh, has gone up to 2.7 as compared to something like around 2.1. So going forward, what we will be doing is we'll be increasing our value proposition to the consumers and also uh, introducing 100 rupee 
price points in the one liter category. This is on the one liter. As far as out of home consumption is concerned, for the 10 rupee price point, uh, Campa Cola is at 10 rupee now. And uh, even the big players like uh, Varun and HCCB also are wanting to cut the prices and will be available at a 15 rupee price point. We have a Tetra Pak which is available at 20 rupee. So we've introduced a 10 rupee bottle. We've introduced a 20 rupee bottle. We've introduced a 65 rupee uh, bottle. And also now one liter is also available and two liter will also be available. So we are trying to plug all price points with uh, juice based uh, drinks across. So with this RGM will be uh, kind of uh, impact. As far as the impact is concerned, I cannot directly correlate the impact, but we can uh, feel a little bit of shift in this coming season from uh, juice based beverages to fizz based drinks. A, the summer was a little bit acute and therefore people preferred refreshment based drinks rather than health based. But I think that was more momentary and transitory and because of the price. So there is an impact, but it's an indirect impact of uh, uh, carbonated drinks on the juices. Yeah. Uh, Mohit, uh, two quick follow-ups here. One, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the shift from uh, uh, the juice uh, towards uh, uh, the fizz, uh, would that be uh, structural in nature? I know uh, you, are, you are taking multiple uh, uh, steps to overcome it. Uh, one is if you could comment on margins, how it impacts, because if you are becoming more sharper in terms of pricing, uh, nothing has changed in, say, raw material, uh, what happens on uh, margins? Second, uh, uh, the, the uh, awareness quotient clearly is increasing for customers. So the, the perception is in fruit juice, yes, it's called fruit juice, but it is sweet, and the fruit content, obviously, people can easily read on the pack. And you also said that in uh, the fizz, uh, fizzy drink, clearly, because it is so hot and so warm, there is a requirement. So even if that is also sweet and maybe for the non-sugar-wise uh, uh, anyway, that uh, issue is not there. So I'm asking, is this a structural issue of uh, more focus on health, so awareness is there? So you need uh, much more in terms of the R&D aspect to overcome it rather than just pricing. And what happens on the margins uh, given the sharper pricing which you have taken? Yeah, so as far as margins are concerned, the margins in the total juice portfolio have actually moved up. And uh, that has happened because of the premiumizing at one end and also introducing these price points which are more value offering to consumers on the other hand, end. So both are kind of going hand in hand for us. So we've introduced coconut uh, water also, so which are margin accretive to us. We've introduced value-added juices also, which are accretive to us, etc. So that is like kind of balancing our margin. And overall, our margins have actually moved up. As far as uh, our representation in drinks and fizz and carbonated is concerned, we are also pivoting ourselves to have representation in carbonated and also in drinks. So that has given us good benefit. As you know, we've got a 200 crore business, which is the drinks portfolio and our fizz based business, uh, fruit based fizz drinks for us has also done very well. We've also introduced cans in uh, Jammu and test market. That is also done exceedingly well in the marketplace. So I think a pivoting the business towards refreshment besides health is there fruit plus fizz is the second vector of growth. Is it a structural change? I don't think it's a structural change. If you look at overall big picture, a 50,000 uh, level view, you find the penetration of uh, uh, juices or uh, fruit-based beverages in India is 8% as compared to China, 25%. And that is the example that I can give you from our neighboring uh, markets. So I don't think there's a structural shift because the penetration of juices is still so low in the country and fruit is definitely considered more nourishing uh, than only uh, flavored waters. So that's what my take would be. Sure, last quick question. So this inventory correction you have done, uh, I, I wanted to ask on that. Uh, so clearly uh, FMCG companies uh, keep doing it. The issue was uh, quantum was extremely high. And we have not seen any other consumer company even talk about it uh, currently. So what is different about your business? Because you are also very diversified. I understand uh, juice business, there was a clear two quarters of issue. But uh, how come it impacts 
overall business and the quantum if you can discuss that second you mentioned uh, in the coming quarters the growth will come back to normal you also said that uh, urban slowdown has uh, bottomed out now other companies are not saying that they are saying this is start and so uh, we need to watch out so what what is your uh, confidence of saying urban has bottomed out is it because you have taken the uh, correction so it's more of a company specific uh, thing you are highlighting So first, let me answer your second question first. I think, as far as urban is concerned, why I say is bottom out is because if you look at the base effect, urban base effect of uh, this quarter as compared to last quarter, there was a very high base. So it's already gone down to around 2.8 percent kind of a growth in FMCG in urban that we are seeing. I don't think so. It's going to go beyond uh, bottoming out from here. And uh, if you really look at the intrinsic urban consumption, which is also driven by e-commerce, quick commerce, modern trade, etc., those uh, channels are definitely showing a high growth, and now they contribute around 24% of the overall uh, salience of the business. That is growing at a very high double digit, and that is 50% of the urban consumption as far as we are concerned. So that is showing no telltale signs of uh, you know kind of diminishing. so that is where i am coming from it's already bottomed out even in gt so whether the consumption is happening through gt or through these emerging channels something so i that's what my take would be that it is bottomed out and uh, as far as rural is concerned rural remains uh, resilient and uh, we see around uh, 130 bips growth uh, in uh, secondary higher in rural as compared to urban for us but if i look at to the nielsen data our growth in rural is 600 basis points higher as compared to urban in rural so rural remains resilient and urban in my view should uh, start recovering with the festive season and uh, we've seen the kharif acreage is also high so that augurs well for rural and there has been msp increases on the rabi crop also which should give more disposable income in the hands of the consumer but food inflation is definitely something which is worrying me which is in the rate of around 9% odd and which is uh, shifting the monies from uh, uh, discretionary to more essential so that was the first part of your question as far as the extent of inventory correction is concerned now extent of inventory correction uh, is high yes but if you look at we decided we were deciding to take this inventory correction but uh, when we pressed the pedal on the 25th till that time our business was doing very well our hpc business uh, till the 25th of uh, september hpc was growing at 9% healthcare was growing at 8% overall business was growing at 6% and beverage business was declining in secondary by 11% so beverage business is the one which exacerbated the whole issue of inventory for us and generally if beverage is high which is also a low shelf life as compared to hpc and hc business with three year shelf life this is only six month shelf life it occupies a lot of space at the distributor end so inventory piles up and the pressure is then felt on hc and hpc business because the entire ecosystem revolves around targets so people have to do their numbers so if one vertical doesn't fire they try to push in the other vertical and therefore inventory piles up so when we took correction now this correction has happened across the board for the entire portfolio but more so in the beverage business that's why optically the quantum is looking high for you so thanks uh, that's all for my thank you thank you thank you thank you ladies and gentlemen we request you to please restrict your questions to two questions per participant you may rejoin the queue for follow up questions we have the next question from the line of mihir shah from nomura please go ahead um hi moy thank you for taking my question so wanted to check uh, would it be fair to assume that the gt inventory correction is now behind completely and cq will be a normal growth quarter and what according to you is normal growth in volume and value terms uh, in the second half uh, so that's my uh, first question yeah so i think inventory correction is behind us whatever inventory correction we had to do we quickly did it uh in one month only rather than prolonging this pain for a long time it's like a disease is better to cure and correct it in uh, one go that we have done so we've done corrections but for uh healthcare business which was pre season and therefore we loaded chavanprash so that that is not compromised 
at all. So that is normal. So second half, we expect to grow uh, back to normal uh, mid to high single digit uh, growth rate for H2 is uh, what we think should be normal. This is subject to uh, good winters and uh, the normal and FMCG also doing well. And we will continue to, to grow give ahead of the we will continue to grow ahead of the category and gain market shares. So the all strategy and big picture, uh, I think matrices are fine. Our market shares are going up. Our household penetrations are moving up. Our distribution is expanding. Weighted is going up. This is one off correction, uh, spring cleaning that we have done, and that too only on behest of our distributors, uh, so that our ROI of the distributors improve. And that's the feedback that we got. So very strong fundamentals of the business, which do not change at all. Got it. So, so fair to assume that, uh, yeah, I see the market shares, uh, you know, they are going up, uh, you know, and maybe the inflationary environment is also kind of helping that from the unorganized players. Uh, but fair to assume that given double rural saliency and winter saliency is high and a uh, large in a year, uh, you should ideally be geared to be a key beneficiary and grow ahead of the markets and peers, right? I mean, I just wanted to get a confirmation on that. Yeah, absolutely. I have uh, no doubts about it. I think we should be going ahead of the market with La Nina here. I hope uh, the winter is uh, strong and more severe and more protracted so that Chavanprash business uh, does uh, well for us. And uh, we have plans to... Uh, recover our beverage business uh, also, which is uh, what is a little pain point at the moment. Understood. Uh, secondly, uh, Mohit, if I want to second, just uh, deep dive a little bit on the hair portfolio, the hair oils, particularly. Uh, if you can give any quality qualification or or quantification, if you can, on how your Amla, uh, you know, Dabra uh, Amla has done, and how do you see that portfolio uh, shaping up? Yeah, so in hair oils, uh, we are market leaders in the perfume category, as you know. We've got representation in perfumed oils, uh, where we have Dabar Amla, and Dabar Amla has got this, it's ring fenced by the flanker brands, which is Sarso Amla, Badam Amla, etc. So the ring fenced brands promise uh, economy to the consumer, and therefore unbranded uh, shift to those uh, branded oils. Dabar Amla is our uh, cash cow and that we are protecting from competitor which is half the price uh, here and therefore the planker brands come in. Uh, we've done well in hair oils, in perfumed hair oils wherein we've gained around uh, 120 bips in perfumed hair oil. So there is Amla, there is Sarso Amla, then there is almond oil where also we have gained market shares from a single largest player in the market. Plus we launched cooling oils in the market, Cool King, Cool King this year will be around uh, 25 crores and it's actually doing very well and the reception from the market is fantastic. So what we are doing is that we have a right to win hair oils and we are trying to plug, we are trying to have representations in different sub-segments of hair oils. So Cool King we plugged, uh, plugged organically and uh, with Sesa coming in, we'll be plugging the Ayurvedic segment. On hair oils, we make a gross margin of around 44. With SESA coming in, it comes at around 57 gross margins. And those gross margins are coming without a scale of procurement of uh, SESA private care as a company. With the scale of Dabar, we feel that we'll be able to take up uh, the gross margins even further. If you look at the price points in the market, if uh, Amla is at 0.45 per ml, this is at 1.7 per ml and uh, so is Cash King at 1.7 per ml. Indu Lekha sits at around 4.7 per ml. So getting the leverage from our uh, scale of uh, procurement, I think these gross margins, 57 is also underpitched. So this is plugging our premiumization strategy. This is plugging our white space strategy and uh, solidifying our and consolidating our core business of hair oils. Plus, it also has opportunity in international business, which contributes to 25% of our hair oils. Uh, for SESA brand, international business is only 11%. So that will theoretically go up to around 25%. But I think that's huge. Like if we do uh, around 1,600 crores in uh, India, 
we do around three to overall around 2000 crore portfolio of hair oils we have in the overall kitty and sesa will only add on to that yeah coconut oils which is another sub segment for us grew by around 14 percent and we've gained market shares the market leader took price increases in coconut oil due to the inflation and so did we the gross margins also inched up uh, there in the coconut oils so sesa can play in two categories for us one is coconut based ayurvedic oils one is perfume based uh, ayurvedic oils so we would want to compete in uh, both the subcategories wherever the consumer need is somewhere the consumer need is pre bath somewhere the consumer need is post bath different markets have different consumer behaviors and we would want to plug that gap here so overall in both the sub segments of cocoa and perfume we've gained market shares so on back of market shares we feel the growth in this category for us will be higher as compared to the market growth rate so this acquisition should not be seen from point of view of that's a hair oil category it's a low growth category it's been stagnant for past three four years and therefore why this acquisition the real rationale for acquisition is we are a 2000 crore business and we want to solidify this business and it's a core business and we will we have market shares of 16 percent and we will we have huge headroom for growth in terms of market share gain that is the way we see it and that's the lens with which uh, we want you to have a look at this thus distribution if you look at double distribution is 45 lakh outlets where hair oil goes to uh, the sesa brand only reaches out to around 6 lakh outlets 6.5 lakhs thereabouts in terms of direct distribution also they are available in 1.2 1.3 lakh we are available in around three and a half to four lakh outlets so i think uh, each of the places uh, we have uh, you know miles to go plus the penetration in of ayurvedic hair oils which are therapeutic hair oils is only around six to seven percent and uh, if you look at the overall market the instance of perception of a hair problem or a hair fall is 60 percent and the penetration is only six percent with a huge headroom to grow here plus there is a extendability of the brand the brand if you look at the most of the market players uh, like induleka and cash king 20 percent of their business comes from shampoo business and shampoo is a huge market again with a high growth rate there of around six to seven percent 20 percent of the market is shampoo market which is extended from ayurvedic so this theoretically can also be extended there around eight percent of sesa's business is coming from shampoo that also has huge legs to grow and hair fall shampoo can be a very big uh, opportunity uh, thanks Mohan. it's great to know it's quite ring fence and seems to be like a good acquisition uh, uh so my last question is actually on the health supplement business you did mention chavanta has grew by 12 percent and that that was a bit of a relief as well um uh, uh, do you expect this continue because if you see over the past three years on an absolute basis the uh chavantash or health supplement absolute numbers are stagnated uh, do you expect uh, growth to finally pick up uh, in the second half uh, in the winter in the health supplements business? And which one did not do well, uh, which led to overall uh, growth to be uh, you know lower at two percent for health supplements? If Shavarta is growing twelve percent, yeah. So you know there is a no stop strategy here. So we are having uh, no hold on to anything whether it's advertising or it's activation or it's trade lubrication i think we are working on uh, all levers to ensure that chavan prash comes back on uh, track and back on the growth path and hopefully with la nina i think chavan prash should uh, continue to grow we've done the loading in the marketplace now we are looking at uh, secondaries to actually uh, pick up in uh, chavan prash we have introduced a format called Khajur Prash, which is basically meant for women and uh, handles iron deficiency in women also. So it's a very tasty variant. I will nudge you all to have it. If we are able to send across the sample to the investor community, we will definitely uh, do the same. So we've done innovation. We've also introduced a small package to Chavan Prash for trials to be generated at around 45 rupees uh, uh, packs sorry 65 rupees uh, pack we've introduced for uh, increasing the penetration we in the quarter two did a monsoon campaign to promote chavan prash's all weather consumption 
Chavan Prash has a perception that it's good only in winters. So to uh, kind of, uh, you know, demystify that Chavan Prash is a all weather friend for building immunity, we did the monsoon campaign and monsoon campaign gave us uh, great dividends in terms of this uh, 12% growth that you see. So, yeah, so we're keeping our fingers crossed that Chavan Prash should fire. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mohit. Wishing you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Avi Mehta from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Dean. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just uh, first bit was on the margin side. You know, with inventory correction largely driving up almost 100 basis points contraction in reported margins at operating level and a move towards giving higher value. Could you help us understand how should we look at FI25 margins? Uh, yeah, hi, hi. I think uh, at a widely, at an H1 level, it is almost 100 bits uh, correction. And uh, now, at least, uh, uh, you know, with uh, with uh, some top line improvement foreseen in S2, with uh, hopefully good winters, and if the top line happens to the level of mid to high single digit, then I think we should be able to leverage cost and uh, protect margins for S2 at least. Depending yeah, on... Sorry, 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 I'm sorry, go on. Yeah. So almost flattish margins, you know, at, at this level that uh, in S2. There'll be, there'll be our Got intent it. at least okay. to get to Fairly clear, fairly clear on that. And the second bit is on the CESA acquisition. Now, while I understand the strategic rationale, uh, could you help me understand, uh, you know, the EPS impact over the next few years? Because it seems at least on year one, there is dilution, but you did point towards synergies. Could you give us a sense on what are the synergies quantum that you're looking over here? Uh, Sajid, Ravi, what will happen? Uh, you know, uh, what will, the process will go into some bit of merger and regulatory approvals. It will take at least one and a half to two years. So next one and a half years, there'll be no impact on uh, double EPS uh, to start with. Uh, post that, uh, we feel that once most of the synergies start coming in, uh, it will be, you know, uh, the operating margin should uh, inch up to 18 to 19 percent, which is similar to uh, to double once the complete synergies uh, get in. Okay, perfectly clear, perfectly clear. And sorry, with the permission, just a clarification. The mid to high single digit growth comment in the second half is on volume basis and the pricing that 2% odd expectations should sustain. Uh, that is correct, right? Yeah, we have a price increase of around 1.5% that we've done in H1, but that price increase in fact is kind of got diluted by the trade and the extra value that we give on the top line. So that is kind of got nullified. So. It's a mid to sing, high single digit kind of a growth rate that we are looking. It all depends upon how the market okay. kind of uh, behaves and uh, grows. To the previous question, uh, we want to mention that uh, CESA business is really gross margin accretive, operating margin accretive, and will provide leverage on all the cost heads to our hair oil portfolio, which is today giving me a operating margin of uh, low double digit, which will end up giving me a high double digit operating margin. So it will be a positive leverage on the operating margin for us. Okay, well, that's very clear, Mohit. Perfect. No, thanks a lot for this and wish you all a very happy festive season. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to you also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have the next question from the line of Harit Kapoor from Investec. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I just uh, had two questions. One was on the uh, in uh, the uh, uh, improving the ROI for the distributor part. So, you know, there are other ways as well in terms of, you know, credit periods, etc. Uh, or, or probably at a, at a numerator level, even tweaking, uh, the, uh, even tweaking the margin. Just wanted to know, uh, have any of those other uh, pieces also been moved or it's only been reducing the inventory pipeline? And uh, uh, if it's only inventory pipeline, uh, in inventory days reduction, uh, at the distributor level, what's the quantum of that? Uh, and is it fair to assume that 
since you stopped this on the 20th, you started this on the 25th, it's, it was six days uh, reduction. Uh, sorry, I, you know, Harith, your voice was a little uh, garbled. We couldn't hear properly, but whatever I could gather, I'm saying that the question is on ROI of the distributors. So the ROI of distributor will be improved on back of the number of days of inventory that he's carrying. He was carrying an inventory of 30 days. And as we speak after the correction, it will be around 21 days of inventory. So ROI substantially improves for him. The turnover remaining the same and the inventory correction will uh, reduce the amount of investment that he has in the business. And uh, therefore, there will be improvement in the ROI. That is what uh, I think the question was. I hope I've been able to answer. Yeah, uh, just the, the question was really apart from this nine day reduction, has there anything else been done, whether it's, you know, uh, credit periods or overall percentage margin, etc.? Yes, for the past uh, couple of months, we've been giving a little extra credit to the distributors also. So that is also gone up because the inventory was high. There was inability on part of the distributor to extend that extra credit in the market place also because he watches his ROI, etc. So I think that uh, credit extensions will also go down, which we were offering earlier. The number three lever is that uh, a lot of stockists used to have stockist salesmen on their payroll. We shifted them from their payroll to a third party payroll, which is a team lease payroll. And uh, some part of the margin was given back to them to improve their ROI also. So all that is uh, also happening alongside. Plus, this is a phenomenon of ROI reduction more in urban India rather than rural India. So in urban, we are also providing some sort of subsidy to our distributors to ensure their ROIs come in. As far as rural is concerned, there is not too much of pain because the cost of doing business is much lower in rural as compared to urban. And urban also the shoe is pinching of these distributors because of the quick commerce and the e-com surge which is happening and uh, uh, some part is the price conflict and some part is also off takes from the retail outlets in urban India going down and therefore the inventory piling up which will get corrected as we have reduced the inventory and going forward we are also looking at a way to do some sort of consolidation of distributors in urban India and uh, not so much in rural. In rural, we will look at expansion of distribution, get into more number of villages and small towns and expand our distribution, divide our distribution into HPC, HC and foods. And urban, look at more consolidation. Got it. But uh, any of these incremental initiatives over the next three months, six months, nine months, in your view, should not have a material impact on the business from a disruption standpoint. No, I don't think there's any disruption in business. No, not at all. I don't think so. This was one-off. And this one-off also we've done in almost 20 years. Dabur has never done it. And this is like a spring cleaning of the house, which was warranted once in a decade at least. So yeah, maybe after a decade or so, you might expect it, but I may not be there then. So I don't think we foresee this happening again. Sure, sure. I'm not so sure if I'll be on a call after a decade as well. So, uh, uh, the second thing was on uh, on uh, on SESA. So, you know, you very clearly, you know, mapped out, uh, uh, you know, the 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 rationale. Uh, I just wanted to get your sense on how are you thinking of kind of category growth because certain interactions that we have for you know the top two players in this space also suggest that their growths have not been so flattering. So, uh, you know, I'm sure you've kind of uh, seen that in when you evaluated this. I also see, based with your numbers, that, uh, you know, there was a slightly lower rate of growth last year for, for this entity. So, uh, you know, so that's my first question on SESA. And the second one really is on the on, on the geographic mix. You know, which part of the market is it, uh, you know, uh, you know, does it have a higher salience? In? Yeah, so as far as SESA is concerned, I told you the couple of levers that, we have, that make us so confident that we will continue to grow and grow at a higher pace, higher growth than what our Hair oils is actually uh, growing. Uh, it's a national brand, unlike a Bacha that we acquired, which is more of a Western brand. 
and their contribution is very con complementary to us. Uh, their contribution comes from Central, which is the mainstay of Dabur, which is UP, Bihar, etc. is 30% contribution. West, which is low for Dabur, they are high, which is 27% contribution coming there. They are over skewed on chemist channel and less skewed on grocery channel, where Dabur is high skewed on grocery and less skewed on chemist. So that provides uh, opportunity as far as we are concerned. North for them is 11% for Dabur is skewed at around 25% double. There, there is upside from our distribution is concerned. East, they are around 20% contribution and uh, for Dabur is about the same. And South, they are higher skewed, 11% contribution in South and Dabur's hair oil is low contribution coming from South and Ayurvedic hair oil is trying to be more salient in South. In Bangladesh, where Dabur is low, they have a high presence. They are market leaders of 90% market share in the Ayurvedic segment in Bangladesh. So they will help and it's a coconut market. So there they help us to premiumize our entire portfolio in Bangladesh. Middle East, which is a huge 25% contributor to our overall global hair oil business, they are not present in Middle East. So that entire uh, place is up for taking. We have the RTM and the GTM established in around 20 countries in uh, Middle East where they have zero presence uh, whatsoever. So that's the upside uh, that we have. In terms of sheer numbers, we have a direct reach of around 4-5 lakh outlets. They have a direct reach of 1.2. So that's direct reach immediately in our control the moment we bolt on the distribution to our distribution. And the indirect distribution is around 6 lakhs as compared to us being around 45 lakhs and this category will have to be advertised and the high gross margins allow that kind of uh, advertising to be done uh, there. They've got 300 odd distributors. We have got around 3000 distributors. So their presence in rural is low. Our presence in rural with Substockis and Yoda network is extremely high. So I think all these are very synergistic sort of opportunities which we saw and uh, it's a premium hair oil and the extension possibilities are many so to shampoo to serums etc and uh, hair care i told you are the instance of 60 percent of problem solution and they solve the problem solution space in the benefit segmentation in a consumer's mind so all these things work in uh, our favor did i miss out any point of your question i don't know no, no, fair, fair, fair point. Uh, if I have anything, I'll come back. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Prakash Kapadia from Spark PMS. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, two questions from my end. You know, Bhagavad you alluded to food inflation being a big curse, a concern in urban demand. So, any sense you could give us on you know, down trading by consumers is LUP increasing and, and you know, you obviously mentioned you feel that, you know, from your own growth should come back. So, you know, what's, what's the outlook on, you know, urban demand coming back? That's the first question. And secondly, you know, earlier, you know, for us and for most of the players in the FMCG business, GT was the real mode, you know, direct and uh, indirect partially then came modern trade and then e-commerce and now you know it's a uh, quick commerce so you know what does the future lie in terms of distribution and sustainable port for us and you know thoughts right so i'll answer your first question prakash so as far as urban is concerned why i'm saying is urban is bottomed out because urban at the same time last year was growing at 11%. Now it's gone down to 2.8%. I don't think urban demand will go down. The last urban demand went down was during the COVID time to around minus 2-3%. And uh, that was under the COVID uh, time. After that, it is, I think, 2.8 is the most, uh, you know, bottom uh, kind of demand that I've seen. And if you look at sequentially, I think the volumes in urban has grown sequentially from quarter one, 2.1 is now to 2.8. If you look at the same period last year in quarter three, the urban demand was 7.7. .7. From 7.7 .7 on that base, 
I think it will be somewhere in the range of around 3, 3.5%. And uh, so I think rural and urban both will inch up like they've inched up. So it's a base effect also, which is kind of kicking in here. And we see urban demand uh, picking up from here. And uh, so the rural resilience is going to be picking up. Now, uh, when the food inflation, food inflation is definitely high. If you look at uh, all the sub-segments of FMCG growth, we find food is the one which is growing on back of value, on back of price increases, whether it's food non-stipples or food stipples. The rest, home care, OTC and personal care by far have remained uh, flat. So I think with urban bottoming out, I see some amount of growth coming in even in the discretionary categories also. And as I told you, the acreage is higher, MSPs have gone up. So hopefully food inflation should also tame going forward. And government is also called out on the food inflation. So there will be steps that the government will also uh, take to tame uh, the food inflation. The second part is uh, modern trade, e-commerce and quick commerce. I think one thing fundamentally is there, which is more, uh, uh, you know, systematically what is happening in India is that uh, uh, GT as a percentage salience will go down and uh, e-commerce uh, driven by quick commerce will only grow in the country. So what we are doing is that we are strengthening our relationship and uh, bondages with e-commerce and quick com players and doing joint business planning with them, creating new products for them, connecting with them on a monthly, quarterly basis and seeing that we continuously grow shares in quick com and e-com portals, be it marketplaces like Amazon, Flipkart or be it quick commerce channel like Swiggy, Instamart, uh, Blinkit and Zepto is concerned. Our growth there is higher than their FMCG growth. So if they have grown by 50%, we've grown by 70% with them on their verticals. So we are ensuring that we grow market shares and we continuously launch innovations which are very customized to these customers for us. As far as modern trade is concerned, our visibility is still a little muted in modern trade on back of investment in modern trade and on back of gaining market shares from other players, I think modern trade for us should also continuously grow. But the quick commerce players are putting pressure on modern trade also besides GT. So if you look at the results of DMART and Reliance Retail, they are also a little under pressure today because the quick com and e-com is actually putting pressure on them also and they would also be pivoting on, uh, you know, multi ways of distribution, whether it's uh, electronically or through offline, etc. So going forward, I think uh, the change, this gradual change from GT to MT to MT to e-com is something which will endure. I don't think this is a flash in the pan and will disappear. I think this is enduring here and this change will come in. How fast we will have to watch. But uh, GT is very integral part today and will continue to be integral part because rural is a huge part of India. So at one end, we would be wanting to consolidate in urban India and other end, we would want to extend our distribution in rural. So keep expanding rural with the sub stock case, with Yodha channel, provide visibility to our business there so that assortment should go up, increase our direct reach in urban, smaller cities, increase our direct reach in rural to have visibility and better assortment, reduce our reliance to wholesale and increase our direct reach. That is the fundamental strategy for rural and semi-urban markets. For metro markets, A10 city, I think, keep expanding along with the Quickcom portals as they expand from 10 cities to 20 cities to maybe 100 cities going forward. Sorry for a long answer, but yeah. No, no, that, that's helpful. So what essentially uh, you are alluding to is, you know, work with them and, you know, try and be part of that and do customization and see what sells and how much we can participate in that growth to adapt to this, right? Is what absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 
fine at least on the urban side and rural still i think uh, the gt would uh, continue to play a role yeah in terms of villages we reach out to 1 lakh 20000 villages headroom is to go up to 6 lakh villages in the country so huge headroom there and in direct reach also overall davards direct plus indirect is 84 lakh outlets we only go to something like 1.4 1. Point, uh, around 15 lakh outlets so where is 15 lakh and we should be minimum around 30% of uh, 84 lakhs so around 25 lakhs and we are only in around 11 lakhs so we can double our direct reach also understand understand thank you that's helpful and uh, wish all of you season greetings thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you we have the next question from the line of percy pantaki from iifl securities please go ahead uh hi mohit and team good evening uh i just wanted to know after this pipeline correction uh, uh what is the distributor days now around 20 21 days and we want to bring it down to around 19 days by end of december and maybe just to add on even this 21 okay. days Uh, it's slightly uh, on the higher side because we are loaded bit of chavan prash uh, bit of chavan prash and seasons to take care of you know season uh, okay okay so even in q3 uh, basically the primary will be lower than secondary by 2% approximately sorry we didn't get what no 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 no, 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 no. No, that is not what. So then, how will twenty one come down to nineteen? Then, Mohit. Obviously, this is on forward cover. So hence, even in uh, uh, December end, we expected to bring it to nineteen to twenty days, maybe around two days more. Because of the season. Okay. Okay. Uh, on uh, uh, beverages, I just wanted to understand uh, where the largest impact. Uh, is so uh, uh, you have the fruit drinks portfolio then you have the nectars and then you have the juices so where is the impact the most i would assume it is in the fruit drinks uh, but just correct me if i am uh, wrong there and secondly uh, uh, the uh, d- drinks that we had i think we ventured into drinks uh, in a material way some 3 or 4 uh years ago i believe in the first year we had crossed 100 crore etc so versus what what was the peak turnover that we did in juices and versus that what is the uh, uh, sort of number that we are likely to do in fi 25 okay let me answer this question our complete beverage portfolio is divided into four parts now first part is coconut water our coconut water we were struck by storia last year who came out with a pet bottle so just to tell you it's a good news that we've bounced back by giving a lot of value in coconut water and the market shares have gone up by 200 basis point the overall active coconut portfolio has increased by 16% in terms of secondary so that's one part of the portfolio the active 100% juices for us has not got impacted by the season uh, i think uh, this is premium portfolio for us which is 7.3% growth which quarter to august was also growing by around 18 19% for us and it's the most uh, margin equitative portfolio so that is the second part of the portfolio the third part of the portfolio is a drinks portfolio which uh, registered a turnover of around 200 crores in the current year we've got a growth of around 16% uh, in this portfolio but the 16% growth is excluding east where we were the hardest hit because of the northeast our per capita consumption of juices is the highest in northeast in india highest and northeast was reeling under floods uh in the quarter 2 and there was a wettest monsoon that we could see in the northeast and that was hit minus northeast our growth was 16 17% northeast impacted and the growth became negative to around 8% but drinks is not what has got impacted so much the real impact which has happened in the nectar business our nectar business has declined by minus 12 so drinks uh, active coconut and real fizz the carbonated portfolio carbonated portfolio grown by 100% for us so therefore there is a tailwind towards carbonated albeit very small for us 
but around 70-80% of the portfolio is real nectar, which is where we got impacted the most, which declined by around 12%. And that decline is basically customers' preferences towards more cheaper alternatives, or is there anything else towards uh, that decline? I think the entire category declined by around 8.6% in terms of volume. We gained market share of 230. So if you compare to relative performance vis-a-vis -vis Tropicana or Slice or Be Natural, Real is surely a preferred choice among the consumer in the juices sure. and nectars uh, market so market shares have gone up so it's a very good sign so in nielsen data we've grown higher than the category that's one but category itself is declining so i think tetra pack is moving into bottles the consumer preference is they want to see what they are having so tetra pack so therefore we've launched a one liter bottle we have launched a two liter bottle We've launched a 500 ml bottle and there is a 200 ml bottle also at all price points of 10, 20, uh, 100 rupee. That is the price point that we have plugged with nectars as well. So that should take care of the problem. And also, is we the, are. Is the, sorry. Is the on. problem in nectars that the uh, average price per liter or per 100 or 200 ml, whatever you count it, it, that is much more expensive versus some of the cheaper options like colas, etc. As you called out that uh, Kampa is uh, sort of giving a lot more value, although it's not a comparable product, but it's like an imperfect substitute. And uh, therefore, people are saying that this is not something uh, that is affordable in light of the other options available in the market. And that's why this category is declining. Is that understanding correct? Yeah, that is the correct understanding. There is a price difference because Kampa for one liter, which is a party pack and in-home consumption, is available at a 45 rupee. Or for the forget Kampa, even Pepsi is or Coke is available at around 50 rupee for a one liter price point. And uh, as compared to a uh, real, which is 70% market share play, it's available at 130 rupee. So there is a definite difference okay. between the two things, yes. So, but uh, Mohit, this is, uh, if this is the reason, then what is the solution? Because then we don't see an uh, end in sight and this can keep declining for many more quarters. So is there an end in sight and is there a solution if this is the root cause? No, so therefore the solution to this is we pivoted into drinks that is why Drinks are pegged at a similar price point as soft drinks. That's exactly what I explained to you. 10 rupee, 20 rupee, 50 rupee, and 100 rupee price point. Drink is pegged at par with the carbonated and fruit based fizz drinks are also at par. That said, it is a small base, so therefore cannot compensate for the 80% of the nectar business. We have to provide value in the nectar business also. Therefore, we are introducing a 100 rupee uh, tropical juices in nectars. And also, we are planning to give a value on nectar by giving a tangible goodie there. So, that is what we are trying to do. But I think it's a matter of time before the pricing will get normalized and this cola war should end. And uh, we have been a little collateral damage in this cola war uh, for past uh, six months or so. But I don't think that is the only problem. I think it's more monsoon and season which created havoc for beverage. Got it, got it, Mohit. That's all from me. Thanks and all the best. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Vora from BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. First question on uh, Namaste litigation, how much did you spend in first half? And uh, what's the status now? How much uh, longer do you expect to continue spending on it? Yeah, so in fact, in uh, first half, we have spent around uh, 40 to 45 crores. And we expect around 85 crores in uh, 85 to 90 crores in uh, in full year. Last year, it was 110 odd crores. And on a yearly basis. So there is a reduction in cost because there has been some optimization not only in terms of lawyers, but also in terms of, uh, you know, uh, their management and uh, more uh, optimization.
optimization of the lower cost. So therefore, we were at 20, 30 crores of saving from last year's base on the litigation cost of Namaste. That said, this is all a provision that we are keeping in our books as the insurance company gives us a guarantee to pay. This part of this provision can be reversed depending upon the case that uh, we are fighting. And there shouldn't be. Is there a visibility on when does this end? Uh, we think around one and a half years from now is the best estimate we, we have got uh, from various uh, lawyers uh, in traction. But uh, knowing US, you know, it, it can do plus minus six months or thereabouts. Yeah. Understood. Uh, second is, uh, how do you like, supply to big commerce? How does it work? Are you supplying directly or through distributors? And how are the margins? Uh, offer to quick commerce companies versus like overall portfolio and uh, as the distribution which is uh, which was like fragmented earlier through GT now like there is a consolidation happening with modern trade and e-commerce especially in cities uh, is there a risk which you see to the margin yeah so we guys used to supply to quick commerce and modern trade through our GT uh, through our GT stockist but uh, I think around a year and a half back We've uh, done direct supplies to the quick commerce players. Let's take an example of Blinkit. So we supply from our side to the Blinkit warehouses. There are roughly around 20 to 30 warehouses they have. From those 20 warehouses, they supply to 500 to 600 dark stores. From the dark stores, it goes to the consumer. So that's the supply chain, which is there uh, from us to the quick commerce uh, players, all of them, whether it's Zepto or Blinkit or it is a Swiggy. As far as margins are concerned, uh, our margins are around uh, 100 to 200 basis points higher in quick commerce uh, as compared to uh, e-commerce marketplaces and uh, moreover compared to GT also, our margins are higher because we sell larger packs to them and uh, TOTs are better as compared to modern trade. But how do you see this consolidation happening on the other side? Modern trade, the e-commerce, they become larger. They will have like higher bargaining power. Do you think this can be a longer term risk to the margin? Yeah, we used to think that there could be consolidation. But knowing India, I think the question of consolidation doesn't arise. Uh, now everybody is pivoting towards being a quick commerce player. So if you look at Big Basket is also a quick commerce and Amazon is also wanting to become a big uh, quick commerce. Tata is becoming a quick commerce. You heard the news today. So I think uh, one after the other, there will be many places. Flipkart is introduced uh, minutes as a quick commerce player. My team is telling me minutes. So therefore, there will be multiple quick commerce players. And the bargaining power shifting in their hands, it's very difficult when there are many players. So uh, I think it will remain in our hands only. And there are so many manufacturers. So question of that, as the market democratizes and more and more quick commerce players come in, I think the, because of the competitive intensity, margins will be where it is. So I don't think margins will go up. Understood. And lastly, how are the distributors reacting to you supplying to various uh, large players directly uh, because their business model will continue to deteriorate. Sorry, I did not get you. Uh, how are the distributors uh, reacting? Your stock is how are they reacting to you supplying directly to various large uh, players like with commerce players, modern trade players? You are supplying directly versus through distributors that year. Uh, as far as distributors concerned, there is a distributor consortium of all India Consumer Product Distributors Association. They are up in arms against all these uh, Quickcom and Ecom players and they have made representations to the Commerce Ministry against them, against the predatory pricing because so many of these quick commerce players are also private equity funded and they subsidize products and come out with events like Big Billion Day, etc. And they deep discount products which become loss leaders and which attract footfalls to them. And then uh, that disrupts the GT market. And as far as the general trade is concerned, they are also the vote bank of the government. So government can't afford not to appease them. 
and that's why you heard so many articles of uh, government uh, uh, against the predatory pricing of these quick commerce players so i think it's a larger question there so obviously stockists uh, have not taken it in good taste of what's happening uh, on quick commerce but you know you can't help it so you have to bypass the stockist and go to them because their terms of trade and their uh, want of uh, products is such which only company themselves can fulfill uh, dark store keeps a inventory of 3 days not more than 3 days which distributors can't fill in which only a company edi direct connect with the blinkit edi can fulfill on a replenishment basis in their warehouse it's not possible for them to supply the entire assortment which may be required by them and that's it the very helpful thank you that's it from me thank you thank you the next question is on the line of shirish pardeshi from centrum stock broking please go ahead hi good evening mohit uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, i was a bit excited uh, I'll not get into the much deeper on the inventory and other thing, but you mentioned in the opening slide the uh, quick commerce growing at a rapid pace, and you just mentioned uh, that the dark store inventory is sub minimal at three four days. So uh, rather than uh, looking at the front end uh, and uh, the distributor connect, uh, do we need to have a breakthrough innovation in the supply chain at the back end so that the distributor inventory correction issue will not come in future? uh so i think uh, the back end is supply chain so supply chain we are actually trying to do an experiment with the uh, blinkit etc to have a direct connect with them in terms of supply chain uh, of our warehouse to their dark store but seems very difficult because they keep a very low inventory and they don't have a backup there and uh, as far as distributors are concerned we are trying a model to something like uh, app to be given to a distributor so that or to a retailer so that direct orders can be sent uh, to us and the delivery and the cash management can happen from the distributor so multiple models on uh, digital we are actually trying an experiment to see how to navigate this problem but the short term solve for us was inventory correction and uh, also moving uh, the salesmen on a third party payroll and we funding and a little bit of uh, subsidy to be given to them to improve their profitability i don't know if i gathered your question correctly yeah no uh, having spent time in fmcg the front end i you know, i was more curious because have you done any studies say for example bombay delhi or for example bombay if would have doing on an average about 25 30 crore on a month basis and there is a quick commerce e-commerce and modern trade which is flourishing is there is a actual demand which has been getting crushed because i still don't understand people are pointing out the urban demand is coming down uh, is there any study or is there any depth you can give me so so as far as uh, you know urban demand is concerned i don't think urban demand is really coming down overall fmcg urban is under pressure because of food inflation that is understood but this urban demand is getting catered through ecom and quickcom because the consumer behavior is changing to wanting to shop digitally and online and not go to a nearby kirana store and what nielsen does is which is a syndicated data that the entire industry refers to looking at the consumer demand uh, in urban they generally track the gt and the pop and mom stores and not so much the quick commerce or the e-commerce players they track mt and they track gt so a lot of demand which is there on uh, e-com and quick com is uh, perhaps not getting captured by the data which is there in urban today so that is also an issue yeah maybe just to add on you know while there is no study on this but the impulsive purchase because of quick com probably the demand is actually getting you know generated but it's not getting captured that may be a, a hypothesis yeah 
But I think the question was. No, I, I'm more curious. I mean, sorry, I'm harping on this. Uh, though we have a product portfolio, maybe because of that we need to keep our inventory at the higher level. Uh, but then, uh, if if I look back, there are so much variation. Certain companies I don't know to name. They keep an inventory of maybe about five six days, and there are certain companies who keep the inventory more than a month. So that's what my question was. That at the back end innovation, because we have digital and AI which is coming up. Uh, so what is the issue uh, to reinvent? Anyway, I'll take it offline. My second question is on uh, the skin care and uh, uh, the, the healthcare portfolio in that specifically OTC and ethical, we are doing better. But in this quarter, the growth rate which was mentioned in the presentation, which is flat. So is there, there is a sharper inventory correction uh, which is there and which is, uh, which is consciously we have done and that's why the inventory has, uh, is under control now or we will have further impact on this? Okay, skin care, as far as skin care is concerned, I think the real reason, the real uh, growth will happen in winter. Skin care consumption for us is more winter skewed. So I think we have a winter portfolio and we expect skin care to actually pick up. As far as market shares are concerned, we gain market shares in FEM also, which is more bleaches. So, uh, but overall, I think skin care is doing okay. The... Secondaries being down in skincare, I think, was more of a collateral damage because of the inventory correction that we've done. It's a small percentage of our portfolio, and uh, therefore, secondary may have suffered because of that. As far as healthcare is concerned, I think all verticals of healthcare continue to do well for us. So, I told you, Chavan Prash is 12% growth. Even honey, we gained market share. The little bit of crystallization problem is behind us. Uh, glucose wasn't salient. Our baby care portfolio grew by around 30% plus. Our uh, lal tail continued to grow. Shilajit had a very high double-digit uh, growth. Uh, Hajmola did well under the digestive portfolio. So I think OTC, digestives, all portfolios did well for us. Now, I think if you're talking about honey test, which would have declined a little bit, I think that is on account of the high basis that we have in honey test. That's why it declined was there in the honey test. Otherwise, I think all verticals of healthcare did reasonably well. Okay. My last question on the international business, though we have done a very good job there, but is there any further room uh, in terms of margin improvement? Because last time when we had a physical meeting, we were banking on the international business will show some good uh, profitability path. Yeah, so international business is doing well. I think one good thing on the margins is that our Middle East, North Africa, which is the most margin equitative geography in the entire region is doing well. And uh, we have a lot of innovations, as I was telling you, that oral care is something that we are doubling down. And oral care profitability is uh, also pretty high in international business that we are doubling down in. And Dabur Red is uh, one of the high priced toothpaste. So I think on back of that, we will expect the margin improvement to happen. So currency depreciation is something which kills us in international, but as we lap over the currencies now, it's been happening over a year. And if you look at the first half also, we are down by 181 on uh, currency, 181 crores H1. on H1 on the currency depreciation. And this currency depreciation is a translation loss. There is also a transaction loss that happens because a lot of the products in international are imported. Uh, for us and we are they have to pay a dollar uh, currency for the import of that especially a uh, turkey market so therefore as we lap over the currencies i think our margins will only improve in egypt and in turkey which are very high salient markets for us okay thank you mohit and ankush uh, happy diwali to you yeah thank you thank happy you. diwali to you happy thank, diwali you. To thank you Ladies and gentlemen, we request you to please restrict yourselves to one question per participant. We have the next question from the line of Vishal Punmia from Yes Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi team. Um, just one question uh, from my side. Uh, so uh, historically, we have been a key participator in the Mahakum uh, Melas. Uh, what are your plans for this year, uh, this fiscal year in Tokyo and uh, if you can also talk about the benefits as well as the cost that go behind uh, uh, this event. 
Yeah, so I think uh, for us, we are a rural salient company. 50% of the business comes from rural. And in rural uh, activations uh, is a very big avenue for uh, to touch, feel and experience the product by the consumer. And we are very aggressive in terms of taking holdings and uh, doing experiential marketing. Uh, last time when Kum was there, uh, we did a special RTP campaign on Kum and had RTP taps that consumer could come and take a toothbrush and take RTP on that and use it. And the more they try, the more conviction they build in the product and the more they buy. So this year also we'll be participating in Mahakum. And uh, we also participate in other melas like uh, Pandarpur Mela, Nochandi Mela, etc., which happen, which is a very huge congregation of consumers. So to provide them uh, uh, experience with our products. Now we have Cool King. So we do special chumpies in these melas also do auto branding, van branding, uh, retail branding, stall branding, etc., which happens, yeah. So, uh, so is there any major benefit that comes in or is it more lagged in terms of uh, uh, demand improvement uh, from all these events? So it's a demand improvement that we get and which results in a better offtake and uh, also sampling. So the more people sample, the more sampling happens, the more uh, cascade effects yeah. through trials and therefore repeat purchase and market shares moving up. So it's very tangible, actually. So, yeah. Understood. Just quickly on the high interest cost and other income for the quarter, if the team can comment on that, uh, that's that would be from my side. Yeah, so first of all, you have to you know, see other income and interest cost uh, jointly. And if you see it jointly, it is almost 18%. Uh, in India, you know, it grew by 7%, but in international, it grew by almost 18%, or sorry, 80% or thereabouts. And this is uh, primarily because of, uh, you know, in international geographies, uh, we had some uh, benefit, uh, especially in Dubai, where some of the yields increased, almost doubled, you know, uh, in certain inter international markets because of inflation and therefore the interest rates going up. So that was the main reason for uh, other income net increasing by 18%. So you have to see them oh, jointly. Uh, thank you and happy Diwali to you. Yeah, thanks. Happy Diwali. Happy Diwali to you also. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take that as our last question for today. I would now like to hand the conference over to Ms. Isha Lamba for closing comments. Over to you. I would like to thank all the participants for joining today's call. The webcast recording and transcript will be available on our website. Thank you and wish you all a very happy Diwali. Thank you. On behalf of Dabur India Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you all for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines.